Back in the early to mid 90s, computers were expensive. And to make matters worse, technology was evolving at lightning speed. CPU clock frequency was literally doubling every couple of years, and software and games weren't really waiting around to take advantage of all that extra performance either. That old saying, it was obsolete before you got it home, well, wasn't that far off really. Although you could sometimes upgrade your CPU to some degree, depending on your motherboard, it was not usually going to provide earth-shattering performance boosts if, you know, two or three years have already passed. And that's why many companies started to go to work producing special upgrade processors. One thing that these special upgrade chips all had in common was that they were designed to make a CPU work in a socket or a system that would not normally be able to support it, providing a substantial performance boost. And unlike a typical CPU, they would often work around electrical incompatibilities by providing their own regulation circuitry on the chip itself. And they often had jumpers and things like that to allow configuration that would not otherwise be possible on older boards. There were some limits to this though, because eventually CPU architectures would change so drastically that it just couldn't be adapted to work on older systems anymore. The big exception to this was really the famous Pentium Overdrive for 486 systems that I discussed in a previous video, and check the description for a link to that one. Socket 7 though, and I include Socket 5 when I say this, was very unique in that it lived for a long time and was used for a huge range of processors from numerous manufacturers between 1994 and 1999 took everything from a lowly Pentium 75 all the way up to a 550 MHz AMD K62. In fact, you could take a K62 and it would physically fit into an old Socket 7 or even Socket 5 board, and amazingly, it would even be compatible from a data bus perspective. But it would be fried in very short order if you actually tried to power it up. The original Socket 5 was designed to work with older P54C Pentium processors that ran at 3.3 volts. Socket 7 added an extra multiplier pin for higher frequency chips, but also introduced split plane voltage for Intel's MMX processors, allowing the processor core to run at 2.8 volts and the I.O. portion of the chip to run at 3.3. Intel eventually abandoned Socket 7 with the release of the cartridge-based Pentium 2 in 1997, but other manufacturers like AMD and Cyrix, they continued to use the platform for quite a while. But the old Socket 7 standard defined in 1995 was not really sufficient from both an electrical and performance standpoint to support the latest chips like the famous K62. And there were some further revisions made, and this is really when Super Socket 7 was born. Super Socket 7 added a few things, including a 100 MHz front side bus, AGP support, and a third multiplier pin for even higher clock speeds. But electrically, it also needed to support lower core voltages used by these newer chips, as well as regulation components to support higher amperage draw. Despite all these changes and improvements though, SuperSocket 7 continued to be backward compatible with even very old P54C Pentium processors. But the big question, of course, that everyone was interested in was whether a top-of-the-line K62 could somehow be adapted to work in a relatively ancient Socket 5 or Socket 7 system. And so long as you could provide the processor with the correct voltage so as not to fry it, and set the multiplier somehow, the answer is usually yes. So today I'm going to be taking a look at an upgrade processor that does just that, the Evergreen Spectra 400. And as the name implies, it's a 400 MHz AMD K62 designed to work in even very old Socket 5 and Socket 7 systems. Being able to take your old Pentium system up to 400 MHz without changing a thing sounds like a pretty exciting prospect. And thanks to Socket 7's longevity, that could be way more of a boost than you'd see on 486 platforms with upgrade chips. So as you can see, it's a very impressive looking package here with multiple layers sandwiched together and some beefy regulation components on the PCB. And wow, that's a lot of layers of pins there, that's for sure. But yeah, not as sleek and compact as some of Intel's overdrive chips, but K62s have much higher amperage draw and clearly they need some larger components. So that's why it also uses this external floppy or Berg style power connector instead of trying to use power from the socket. So on the Spectra, there's a few jumpers on the side of the chip. The first is for voltage selection. Nice bonus since you could, in theory, remove the K62 and replace it with something different. Perhaps a mobile chip that requires lower core voltage or maybe something that needs more. But yeah, you know me. We'll be messing around with this shortly, so stay tuned. The second set of jumpers is for multiplier selection. And because the K62 uses extra pins for multiplier purposes, Older boards just can't set them correctly, so the BF0, BF1, and BF2 pins on the motherboard socket are basically bypassed completely and not used. 
the Spectra takes care of everything needed to set these. It's set to 6x by default. And interesting fact, the K62 with three pins for multiplier selection allows a maximum of two to the power of three or eight multiplier combinations from 2x to 5.5x. But depending on the K62 chip itself, the 2x multiplier combination operates at 6x instead. So why a six times multiplier? Wouldn't a K62400 need a four times multiplier? Well, the higher end K62 chips were designed for Super Socket 7 boards with a 100 megahertz front side bus. And although Evergreen can feed the chip the correct core voltage and set unsupported multipliers, it can't have any influence on the front side bus speed that the motherboard runs at. The vast majority of Socket 5 and 7 boards will run at a maximum of 66 megahertz. And to get the 400 megahertz clock speed, you'd need a six times multiplier. So at 66 megahertz, we really couldn't push this chip any further even if we wanted to. So if you were thinking of you know, pulling out the 400 megahertz processor and replacing it with a 550 megahertz, for example, there's really no point, unfortunately. Not sure if you noticed, but the actual K62 processor sitting in the interposer here isn't a 400 megahertz chip. In this example, it's actually a 450 megahertz K62. I'm not sure exactly why Evergreen did this, but I suspect that it was just due to the supply and cost of what was available at the time. Now, obviously there are some performance benefits to running a 100 megahertz bus speed. You've got faster memory, faster L2 cache. So we'll have to see what kind of an impact running at 66 megahertz will have. We'll do some comparisons to an actual SuperSocket 7 system with the same CPU in a bit. On the bench, I have a board you may recognize from a few of my older videos. This is the Full Yes 82430FX. And I chose this one because it's the oldest Socket 7 board that I have. It would be a pretty good representation of what somebody may have wanted to upgrade back in the day. So a system like this would have been considered pretty high end and fairly typical in late 1995, I would say. Although the board is a Socket 7 board, it actually has no support for MMX processors out of the box. And you have to add a special VRM module here to provide the correct voltage for them. By the way, I'm going to include a link in the description to a really cool project that Necroware is working on that takes advantage of this slot. Something I'm very excited about trying out, actually. This board also uses um, SRAM cache, very similar to what you'd find in a 486. I did upgrade it to 512K a while back, but it definitely won't be as quick as later boards that have pipeline burst cache. For a CPU baseline, I've got a Pentium 100 installed here. This is actually the CPU that came with this board when I bought it, so it's quite literally what somebody used back in the day. And although the Pentium 133 was available by late 1995, I think that the Pentium 100 was much more common to see in systems at that point, as well as the Pentium 90 and Pentium 75. So for graphics, I've got the very popular S3 Verge here. Not gonna win any awards for 3D acceleration, but a very good all around card that was common to see in late 1995. And for sound, just got the trusty old Sound Blaster 16 in an ISA slot. Playing a state of the art game like Quake, which was released in 1996, it's a very enjoyable experience on a Pentium 100. May not be the smoothest gameplay at 320 by 240, but it's certainly fluid enough. And at this point in time, you still probably felt like your $3,000 plus dollar system was doing its job admirably. Even if we fast forward a year into 1997, games like MDK still played quite well. Maybe a tad choppy at times, but certainly not leaving you feeling like your system was obsolete. But moving into late 1997, early 1998 with games like Quake 2, things were changing quickly and the CPU demands were rising very noticeably. And although the system is still just barely meeting the minimum system requirements for the game, oof, it is not pretty. In smaller areas without too many enemies, the game's somewhat playable. But when the going gets tough, oh, good luck. At this point, you'd probably be thinking about upgrading either a faster CPU or maybe getting one of those newfangled 3D accelerator cards to take some burden off the poor Pentium 100. But if you manage to hang in there for another year, this is what the best of 1999 could manage on that aging system. This is the need for speed high stakes at 320 by 240 running in quote unquote widescreen mode for less demand on the system. And yeah. Total slideshow and just laughable. <laughs> it's so bad. And into the year 2000, here is Diablo 2. I literally had to try three times just to even get the game to start. It would often crash to the desktop, but if you did manage to get a game started, this is the kind of choppy gameplay that you can expect. But honestly, by this point, the system is just way below the minimum system requirements, which actually calls for a Pentium MMX 233 or faster. 
So let's see what happens when we get this Spectre installed and see if this gameplay can be improved. So before I remove the Pentium 100 to install the Spectre, let's just talk about the jumper situation here. So the Pentium 100 is a 66 MHz front side bus chip with a one and a half times multiplier. So we literally don't have to change anything at all to get the full 400 MHz out of the Spectra. The only time you'd need or want to change anything is if you had a 50 or 60 MHz front side bus chip like the Pentium 75, Pentium 90, 120, and so on. Otherwise, the Spectra would be stuck running at 300 or 360 MHz. Since the OEM heatsink was blue, I'm going to use this old Socket 7 heatsink, which actually fits perfectly, and it's about the same dimensions as the original. This one had an old metal clip that rusted and broke, and uh, the fan was dead, so I replaced it. Can't really use it for anything else, so I think it's the perfect candidate. I will attach this properly at some point, but for now I'm just going to put a bit of thermal paste on the chip and allow it to sit there under gravity. With a bit of pressure applied, the paste helps to suction it down somewhat and it just keeps it from sliding around while well in use. So without further ado, let's power this thing up. And it posts! Nice! <laughs> but yeah, as expected, it has no idea what's in the socket. Amazingly, it's reporting it as a 486DX266. This BIOS and board can't even run a 486, so I have no idea why it's even able to list that one. So yeah, BIOS is very clearly confused here, but that's okay. Let's boot into DOS and run check CPU and see what it has to say. And there we go. BIOS may be confused, but check CPU can read the CPU identifier just fine. And it sees we have a K62400 installed with a 6x66 MHz clock. And as much as I want to dive into the benchmarks right now, I'm going to do a bunch of comparisons soon, so stay tuned for more in a bit. So was I just lucky that my board worked with this chip installed? I've got to imagine that there are some systems out there that may do more than just report the wrong CPU identifier. But even this, I'm sure, would have caused confusion with buyers and probably resulted in some product returns. Wouldn't it be nice if Evergreen provided an updated BIOS to include support for the CPU? But yeah, I mean, there's hundreds if not thousands of possible motherboards that this thing could be installed in. It's just not possible. Or is it? That's my sad attempt at some dramatic foreshadowing. I never knew they did this back in the day, but can you believe that Evergreen included a CD with literally thousands of updated BIOS files for just about every Socket 5 and Socket 7 motherboard you could think of? They did indeed. I count no fewer than 3,600 files on the Spectra 400 Utilities disk. Just amazing. Now, obviously, I don't think they created all of these manually. There must have been some automation to inject the necessary changes into the original files, but still, that's some dedication. I don't have the original floppy disk and Evergreen CD, but thankfully both are available on the Vogon site for download. And also, thanks to someone named Richard G 867 there's a complete dump of all the BIOS files from numerous Evergreen CDs uploaded to the Internet Archive. And not only did he upload them, he actually decoded the compression used on them to allow them to be used with any flashing utility instead of just the one included by Evergreen. So the big question is whether the Evergreen upgrade tool will be able to find a BIOS for my somewhat obscure Full Yes 82430. So I'm going to go through the proper process that Evergreen intended with their floppy and CD to get the full experience. And yeah, I did do things backwards on purpose, you know, just for science. I was very curious what would happen with the original BIOS. And although you may be tempted to start with the CD, most of the magic happens with the provided floppy disk. So the first step is to boot into Evergreen's upgrade utility. It does take a long time to load, but it pulls your system for all kinds of information in the background and writes it to a file on the floppy for use later on. Once the interactive part of the utility loads, it automatically starts benchmarking your old CPU for a baseline. So as you can imagine, showing the before and after scores would give customers that warm and fuzzy about their purchase. There's some useful information that you can view here as well, including what you should change your bus speed to if applicable. And there's also a warning about older builds of Windows 95. If you didn't know, the original Windows 95 release was actually speed sensitive. It would crash out if you booted up with anything faster than a 300 something megahertz CPU. So obviously the Spectra 400 would be a problem. Thankfully there is a patch for that though. You can also take a look at some of the system information the utility collected here. It pulls some data about the BIOS, including the uh, version and date code and things like that. And that'll be used in the next step to see if there's a suitable replacement. But it did identify the board as a full yes, which is interesting here. Once the information about your system has been written to the floppy, the next step is to run the utility on the CD from Windows. 
The utility will read the system information collected earlier, find the correct BIOS file for the specific system, and then write just that one BIOS file to the floppy disk for the next step. Next, you boot from the floppy again, but this time you'll see that the option to update the BIOS is no longer grayed out. After a bit of information about the flashing process is displayed, what appears to be a modified version of the award flashing utility is used to back up the original BIOS and then flash the new one. And after rebooting, I can see that the new BIOS dated March of 2000 is now on the system. I see the text string saying that the upgrade BIOS is provided by Unicore Systems. Not sure who they are, but I assume they're the ones who created all of these for Evergreen. But as an added bonus, it looks like the new award BIOS is based on a much newer version, 4.51. That has the added benefits of better hard drive compatibility, the option to boot from CD-ROM, which it couldn't do previously, and there's some other options for PCI performance tuning, so very nice. So with the BIOS updated, let's get the Spectre installed again and see if it's detected correctly this time. Yes indeed, K62 400 MHz, excellent. I went ahead and booted from the Spectra install floppy one last time to see the after benchmark results. And look at that, a 4.3 times increase in the dry stone score and almost eight times the media stone performance, which is not too surprising given the old CPU didn't support MMX extensions. But if you bought this CPU and got this far, I'm sure that would have looked quite impressive. But numbers are one thing, how does it actually stack up in real world use in gaming? And immediately I noticed a very big improvement. Windows booted much faster, things felt snappier, and newer games like Need for Speed High Stakes run beautifully now. In software rendering, the 400% gain in CPU performance just makes a world of difference. Here's what it looked like before, just in case you forgot how painful that was to watch. Even games like Half-Life are nice and smooth and totally playable now. Granted, this is low resolution software rendering, but considering what it could do before, that's very impressive. Diablo 2 is also very enjoyable now. Even with all kinds of enemies on the screen here, the frame rates are quite acceptable, and I'm not getting any of the crashes and instability that I experienced before. One other bonus of upgrading to a K62 is the multimedia extensions. Not only does the processor support MMX, but AMD's enhancement of it called 3D Now. 3D games coded to support the extensions can have greatly improved float point performance and higher frame rates, so not too surprising that Evergreen included the 3D Now 3.20 patch for Quake 2 on the utility CD. And I gotta say, Quake 2 just runs very smoothly now. Most of that is due to the much faster CPU, but the extensions do help to improve things to some degree. Another thing to consider too is that with that much extra CPU performance on tap, adding a 3D accelerator like the 3DFX Voodoo 2 would have been a very viable option. Although it would have helped a Pentium 100 as well, a lot of its potential would have just been wasted with such a slow CPU. A 400 MHz K62 on the other hand, even if it is running on an older platform, is plenty for the Voodoo 2 to shine, and the gaming experience is completely transformed with higher resolutions, great lighting and effects, and all the other goodies that come with it. True, it would have added another $300 or more to the upgrade, but it's pretty hard to believe that almost all of this system is made up of hardware from 1995. Really impressive, that's for sure. K62 was a great processor back in the day, but believe it or not, it was not the fastest Socket 7 chip. A few months later, in 1999, AMD released the K63. Really, the K63's core is very similar to the K62, but there was one really big difference between the two, on-die L2 cache memory. Similar to Intel Celerons at the time and the Coppermine Pentium 3s that came after. Having L2 cache on the CPU die running at the full processor frequency can provide a very significant performance boost in some situations. This cache too would be so much faster than the sluggish SRAM on this old board. So if it works, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. But unlike Intel's later platforms, which didn't have cache on the motherboards, we can still take advantage of the 512 kilobytes here. It simply gets added as a third tier or L3 cache. So I've got two CPUs here that I wanna try out in the Spectre's Interposer and see if we can get the system running even faster, if you can believe that. So the first here is an AMD K63 400 megahertz. So I'm not sure if you can see that too well, but I'll get a picture of that. So this one here would be a perfect match for the six times 66 megahertz maximum. And this K63 here is rated for 2.4 volts, a little bit spicier than the K62. So I'll just need to adjust the voltage jumper for it. 
The second chip I have here is an interesting one. So this is a K62 Plus 500, which is a mobile processor that runs at only two volts. The K62 Plus is basically a die shrunk 180 nanometer version of the K63, but it's got half of its L2 cache disabled for 128 kilobytes. The uh, reason I want to try the K62 Plus is that compatibility for these mobile chips can be a little bit spotty, and I'm just curious to see if the updated BIOS will support it. You'll notice I don't have the chip fully inserted into the socket here. Normally you shouldn't see the pins and it should be fully seated, but this is not a zero insertion force socket, that's for sure. And it is a royal pain to try to pry it out. I just wanted to make my life a bit easier since I'm gonna be swapping them around. But as you can see, just prying gently at each corner eventually releases the chip. So I was happy to see that the updated BIOS detected it as a K63. But the big question, of course, is whether or not the on-die L2 cache is functional and if the onboard SRAM will be working too. Best way to test this is to run SpeedSys from DOS. You can visualize the different cache levels very clearly if they're working properly. And yeah, look at that, lightning fast L2 cache all the way up to 256 kilobytes. And after that, you can still see the slower SRAM taking over before eventually switching over to main memory. So this seems to be a fully functional K63 with tri-level cache. Pretty amazing for such an ancient board. And last but not least, the K62 Plus is also detected correctly. See a very fast cache tier all the way up to 128 kilobytes. And then the functional SRAM is L3, so this one appears to be fully functional too. All right, so let's take a quick look at some benchmarks. I don't want to focus too much on numbers today, but I did want to check three things. First, to compare the Pentium 100 with the Spectra to see how much of a boost there was. Second, to compare the Spectra and my old 430FX board with the same chips in a real SuperSocket 7 system with a 100 megahertz bus speed and all the trimmings. And last, to see how the Ondai L2 cache benefits the Spectra with the K62 Plus and K63. First, let's look at Evergreen's included benchmarking tool. The dry stone measurement looks purely at basic integer math performance. And as we saw earlier, the Spectra 400 outperformed the Pentium 100 by over four times. Not surprising given the fourfold increase in frequency. Neither the Pentium 100 or Pentium 200 here support MMX extensions, so they are lagging way behind in the MMX optimized media stone measurements. None of the AMD chips showed much of a difference here because these benchmarks don't really take advantage of main memory or L2 cache. We'll need some real world gaming benchmarks to highlight those differences. First up is Quake, a game that's not too demanding for older Socket 7 chips, but as you can see, the Spectra 400 doubles the frame rate from 25.8 to 49.3 frames per second. Very impressive and very noticeable. The fast on die L2 cache of the K63 does make a substantial difference here, with an extra 10 frames per second added on top of the K62. But as expected, the real Super Socket 7 platform really does let these chips shine with a more modern chipset, faster pipeline burst cache, SDRAM, and a 100 megahertz bus clock. Even the regular K62 goes from 49.3 to 73.8 frames per second. We see a pretty similar pattern here in Quake 2 with the Spectra doubling the frame rate of the Pentium 100 from less than 10 frames per second up to 19.2. Doesn't sound terribly high, but remember this is software rendering and it means the difference between being almost completely unplayable and being enjoyable. Quake 2 really takes advantage of more and faster cache memory, it seems. The K62 Plus and K63 show some pretty substantial gains over the K62 here. So there you have it. Really hard to believe that you could see such massive improvements with nothing but a simple CPU swap. To be able to bring a system four years ahead in performance at a time when technology was evolving so quickly too is just truly amazing. A lot of this was possible thanks to how long of a run Socket 7 had, but there is no doubt that these upgrade chips have a very special place in computing history. They found their way into many systems in the late 90s, and they saved people a lot of money. Did you happen to use one of these back in the day or know someone who did? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear some first-hand experiences about them. But that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more content like this. And as always, be sure to check out the video description below for more information and some useful links. Thanks again.